Um, so I want to speak on um, it's our money, we should own the bank. In fact, I think I will argue that we actually create the money. Um, uh, Brigida was mentioning about how we're not encouraged to learn about money and so forth. It seems to me the whole concept of money is kept in the dark. So I've spent a lot of time figuring out what is money, what do we need banks for, what do banks have to do with it, sort of in housewife's English to figure out what's really going on here, what are, in, in all this complexity, what's really happening. So I'm going to start with a joke. This is a, um, this is a uh, Woody Allen joke from Annie Hall. This characterizes our relationship to the banks, I think. Uh, so this man says to another man, he says, um, my brother's crazy, he thinks he's a chicken. And the other man says, uh, well, why don't you get some treatment for him? And so the first man says, well, we would, but we need the eggs. <laughs> so that's pretty much what our whole banking system, it's totally ephemeral. It's totally, you could call it a fraud, but we need the eggs. It's our entire banking, our entire monetary system consists of credit, and it's all created by banks. So I'm going to argue that what we think is wrong with the system, that banks create money, is not what's wrong with it. That is probably the best thing the banks ever did, was create this, this credit system that allows anybody to get credit, not counting the fact that they've got control of the spigots, but that you're not limited by somebody else being willing to give up their gold. The, the bank will make credit available to whoever walks in the door, assuming they've got the other requirements, which I think are not necessary, really. Um, in fact, I read this in a, in a banking textbook. It said bank, bankers early on realized that um, it was not sound business practice to turn people away when they walked in the door for a loan. So they would make the loan first, and then they would figure out how to get the money. And so that's basically how, how banking works. But we could be doing that ourselves. So I would say what's wrong with the system is not that they create money, it's that they own the banks. That we sh it's our money, really. We create the money. The, the borrower creates the money. And that we, the people, should own the banks. And then the system will work, work quite well. So just to, this, this chart just shows that banks, banks create all of our money today, virtually all of our money. Uh, the only money that the uh, Treasury creates are, are coins, which compose about, I think, um, is it $4 billion, I think. So uh, the blue line is um, MO, which is created by the Treasury and the Federal Reserve together, but very little of it's the Treasury. So it's the Federal Reserve, which is, as we already heard um, this morning, is from, is itself owned by, or composed of 12 branches, all of which are 100% owned by the banks in their district. So it's actually private itself. And all of this money, so all the rest, this great big, the line on top, that's M2, all of that money comes from somewhere else. That comes from banks, which created on their books. And there's actually M3 that doesn't even show on this chart, which is, it goes up to about 16 trillion. So all that money comes from somewhere else. It's created by banks on their books. Um, and many authorities have attested, so attested. This is one I like because he's so direct about it. It was U.S. Treasury Secretary Robert B. Anderson in, uh, under Eisenhower. He said, when a bank makes a loan, it simply adds to the borrower's deposit account in the bank by the amount of the loan. The money is not taken from anyone else's deposit. It was not previously paid, paid into the bank by anyone. It's new money, money created by the bank for the use of the borrower. And this is uh, Frederick Soddy's realization, which is a bit like Woody Allen's real realization. Um, I thought that as a scientific man, I ought to know something about economics. So I studied the money system for two years and could make nothing of it. Then one day, the truth dawned on me. What I was studying was not a system, but a confidence trick. And that's what it is. But it's actually a good confidence trick in this, well, I'll get, get to that. But here's the way it works. Um, if you go to the bank and you want a $500,000 mortgage, you will sign a piece of paper, a promissory note, to pay back this $500,000.
And so the bank will write your promissory note on one side of their books as an asset to themselves because you've agreed to pay that money back over time. And then they'll write it as a liability to themselves on the other side of the books because they have agreed to cover the check when you write that $500,000 to your seller. So it all comes out to zero, so they say they haven't really created anything. But that check that goes out the door is where our money comes from. Oops. So we have um, the catch, of course, for the bank is that they have to clear their checks. So that means they have to basically have as much money coming into the bank as going out of the bank. That's what they need the deposits for. Like theoretically, if you had $100 in deposits, you could lend $90 and then you it, taking, keeping back 10% for the reserve requirement. I don't want to get into that part. But anyway, theoretically, you lend about as much as you have. But the catch is that what you have, the depositors have a claim on. I mean, the depositors think they've got that money, and they think that whenever they go to the bank, they can get it. But you just lend it out to somebody else. And the reason the system works is that these checks are flying back and forth all day, and they only have to... Um, balance their books at the end of the day. And if they don't have the money, they borrow it back from the bank that they just lent it to. And they only do that overnight. It's called a repo. They've agreed to give it back the next day. So they only have it, they only borrow it long enough to balance their books and then they give it back. So it's all a huge shell game. Um, so let's say bank A creates a $500,000 mortgage and bank B creates a $500,000 mortgage and the sellers of these houses are in the opposite banks. So they each have $500,000 going into the other bank. So the, the check's clear. They both, you've got a new million dollars out there, and yet nobody really has to borrow any money because they both had that much money coming in and going out. So all you really have to worry about at the end of the day is if you don't have as, as many deposits as, as you have money going out. So basically, what's really happening here is the real role of the bank is not to lend somebody else's money or to lend their own money. The real role of the bank in this whole lending credit process is to turn your credit, your IOU, into something that you can spend in the marketplace. So if you went to the grocery store and you said, I don't have the money now, but here's, here's my IOU. I'm just going to scribble this out here. And you know you can collect it later when I've got the money. The bank wouldn't take it because, I'm sorry, the grocer wouldn't take it because he doesn't know you and he doesn't know whether you'll really pay or whether you'll come up with the money. But you can go into the bank and the bank will take your IOU and the bank will give you cold hard cash for it. Of course, they want something in return, but they've got all the, they're set up for this. So they can determine how you're going to pay it back. They can determine what, what you have to foreclose on or what they can attach. They've got the sheriff behind them in the court system. So they know they're going to, they can follow through and collect on your promissory note. And if you don't pay, they've got, they'll take interest to cover, supposedly to cover the defaults. We know they take a lot more interest than they need to cover the defaults. But anyway, they're, they're pretty much covered. So they're willing to turn your IOU into something you can spend. It's like a negotiable instrument or a non-recourse um, a, a pay, pay to bearer instrument. In other words, you, if, you're the, if you've got the dollar, you don't, whether the dollar is good doesn't depend on whether the person who borrowed it in the first place pays up. That the dollar is good in the marketplace, so that it's the bank that's taking the risk that maybe the borrower won't pay up. So it's basically a big community currency system. That's really what we've got, and that's what we should have. The whole nation should be one big credit clearing system uh, operated as a public utility, and then the flaws would be out of it. The flaws of it in it right now are that bank, private banks have control of the money spigots because they're private, and so they determine who gets the credit. They can. Uh, if they make more money making a loan to a hedge fund, say a billion dollar loan to a hedge fund, than to make a $10,000 loan to a little business that might not survive. Um, so today, they obviously go for, for where, the, where the money is, the quarterly, quarterly profits, and they don't look, they, they're not there to serve the, 
the public interest. But in other countries, for example, Germany, which has a very strong public, sec uh, public banking sector, those banks are mandated to make loans to the local to lo local businesses. That's their job, is to serve the public interest. And the Bank of North Dakota is our one bank in the US on that model. Um, the, the catch in the whole scheme, it would all balance out except for the interest. The problem, other, several people have mentioned that banks create the principal, but they don't create the interest. And since they're virtually the sole source of money in the system, in order to find the interest, either you, somebody, has to, somebody else has to take out a loan, so you have this continually growing um, stack of loans, or you have to fight somebody else for it. In other words, somebody's going to not be able to pay on their loan. So you have this limited amount of money, so you always have this, um, this scarcity mentality in the sense that you have to fight for it. And the result is a pyramid scheme um, where you're always borrowing more and more, which works well, and the, and the interest is not going back into the economy. We know that because uh, there was a recent study finding that between 21 and 32 trillion is now in offshore tax havens, and most of that money comes from, originated in Wall Street. So that's the size of, that's half the size of the global GDP. So this, there's this huge parasite on the side of the economy it's drawing money out and not putting anything productive back in. They're just, it's money making money, continually drawing money out. So that system works until you run out of borrowers, or in the, in the case of a parasite, I think this is a picture of a parasite, when the, when the parasite runs out of its food source, then it all of a sudden plunges down, and that happened with the subprime um, crisis where they ran out of good borrowers, so they resorted to the subprime borrowers, and they wrapped the whole thing in a derivative to make it look like AAA when it really wasn't. And then when it was discovered that it really wasn't, the whole thing collapsed. So where we are today is that we've run out of borrowers. And so the taxpayers are now supporting the banks instead of the banks um, supporting us. But it doesn't have to be the, that way. There is another model. There is another way to do it. And the ideal of this this model actually, it might sound a bit socialist, but it actually came from us. It came from the US. Um, the best of the public bank models was in colonial Pennsylvania in Benjamin Franklin's time. So you had the colonies issuing, issuing their own um, script. They, didn't, they weren't borrowing and they didn't have gold, so they actually just printed their own money. But many of the colonies just printed and printed, and they tended to hyperinflate the system. But in Pennsylvania and a couple of other colonies that had their own land banks, they lent most of the money. So you would print and lend. So you might print, in this example, you would print $105, lend 100 at 5%, spend the $5 for things that people need. So that money would be out there in the system. You're not just sucking it, sucking it away and just socking it in. Um, offshore tax havens, you're returning it to the money supply. And so you would have 105 out there to come back as principal and interest, so then you would lend the 100, spend the 5, over and over, and you wouldn't have to expand the money supply. So during the time that that system was in place, um, the colonists did not pay taxes except for a, an import duty on, or a excise tax on um, liquor. They did not have debt and prices did not inflate. So it was a quite sustainable system and the government basically paid for itself. The taxpayers didn't have to do it. So we have one state that follows, that has its own state-owned bank, only one, that's North Dakota. It's also the only state that escaped the credit crisis. Um, every year since 2008, it's had a nice budget surplus. Um, it has the lowest unemployment rate in the country, the lowest default rate on loans, and the lowest foreclosure rate. They've had this bank ever since 1919 when the, um, the Wall Street bankers were foreclosing on the farmers and the North Dakotans wanted to keep their money in North Dakota and so they just set up their own bank. So again, it sounds a bit socialist. But North Dakota is a very Republican state. It, for them, it was a go local thing. It was 
bring, keep our money in our local community. Um, the, this model is all the state's revenues go into the bank by law. And for capital, originally they, they did um, do a bond issue to raise the capital, but they've also set the bank up as um, a DBA of the state. So it's North Dakota doing business as the Bank of North Dakota. So technically, all of the assets of the state are the assets of the bank. So if you wanted to, like if California decided that we're, we'd better set something up and very quickly, you could just make your bank a DB of the state and you've got the capital requirement covered. And you can obviously get plenty of um, deposits from your revenues on that same model. So these are all, sorry? So these are all the things that the BND does for the state. Um, it's, uh, North Dakota is a state of 670,000 people and it, the Bank of North Dakota pays a dividend or has for the first decade of this millennium of um, $30 million a year back to the state. So it's a big revenue maker for the state. It uh, has a return on equity of 17 to 26%, which is huge, particularly if you compare it to the 25% and 30% that the California pension funds lost the two years after the, the uh, banking collapse. It pays competitive interest on state deposits. It has a mandate to serve the public interest. It partners with the local banks. So it's actually like a mini Fed for the state. So it helps the local banks by, um, it guarantees their loans, so it helps them with re capital requirements. So they're not squeezed out by Basel III, which is squeezing out all the other little, little banks. They've got capital covered. It shares in the loans, so they can make much bigger loans than they would otherwise. So it allows the local banks to service the local community, and it, it helps with their liquidity. Um, it also has uh, credit lines to the state and local governments. So instead of having to ha have these very wasteful rainy day funds where you've got all this money socked away, just in case you don't get enough taxes one year, you, um, they don't have to worry about that. They just go tap up their credit line with the Bank of North Dakota, and then that did happen one year, I, I guess early in this decade where North Dakota went on over budget and so they just borrowed from the Bank of North Dakota and the next year they were fine, they just straightened it out. Uh, in California we have, I think it's, um, is it 600 billion in, uh, in that's just stuck away in these little, um, it's CAFR money, the Cal comprehensive annual financial reports show all this money is socked away in little um, uh, rainy day funds that they don't get together. They're not used for anything. They're, um, the, part, the, the funds that are in the treasurer's investment pool, which is about 70 billion, that money is now earning 0.49%. So they're earning almost nothing. And so you can make much, much better use of this money, particularly if you didn't have to worry about a rainy day, if you had a credit line with your own bank. Um, they give low interest loans to, for local projects. They under, underwrite municipal bonds so you don't have to worry about uh, rating agencies and interest rate swaps and all these horrible things that are bankrupting our local cities and counties. Um, the, the banking costs are quite low because they don't advertise, they, they have a captured market, et cetera. And they, somebody else mentioned about disaster relief. They're right there in the event of a disaster. Uh, making loans to everybody. Get, they did a moratorium on loan on uh, foreclosures. The, um, unlike your your insurance companies that will say something like, "Oh, sorry, you had a different kind of flood. <laughs> you know, you weren't covered for that type of flood or something." The the Bank of North Dakota is there to serve the community, and they're right there in the event of an emergency. And one of, the, one of the best things about owning your own bank is you can cut out interest. You get the interest back if you're the state. So um, Margaret Kennedy is a German researcher. She found that between 35 and 40 percent of everything we buy goes to interest. So if you own your own bank, you reduce the cost of public projects by about a third. In California, as of 
2010, we had outstanding general obligation and revenue bonds of 158 billion. Of that, 70 billion was for interest. So if we had been um, borrowing from ourselves all along, we could have saved 70 billion or we'd be, our debt would be 70 billion less than it is now. 20 states have now introduced bills of one form or another for state-owned banks. Um, and the, the one that actually got the farthest was California. It was AB 2500, brought by Ben Hueso of San Diego. And it, it, this was a year, oh, oh sorry, 750, yeah, AB 750. Um, it, it was a year and a half ago. It passed both houses of the legislature and uh, the governor didn't sign it because he said it was a bill for a study, a feasibility study. And he said, well, we have plenty of committees. We don't need another committee. Um, we can do this in-house in our banking committee. But of course, we haven't heard any more about it. So what we need to do is get a fire under him. We need to give him a reason to really look at this and to push it forward. And then Ben Hueso brought, it, brought another bill for um, actually to establish a bank, but I guess it got stalled in committee. So yeah, it's dead for the time being. But anyway, we've made a lot of progress on these bills. What we need to do now is to give them a reason to, to move on them. Um, um, legislators are inherently conservative. They don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to go against their big money uh, campaign contributors unless they have a big push from the, from the populace or they have some other reason to do it. Uh, the three big objections we've gotten to these bills are, one, that government can't afford to lend its money. We need our money for our budget. Well, we've seen that the banks don't lend their money. They don't lend their own money and they don't lend their depositors' money, not really. Um, they, they create new money. So if you're a bank, you can basically double your money. You've still got your deposits there. The state right now is putting their money in Bank of America. Now, is that is Bank of America lending their money, or are there, their deposits are still there, and yet Bank of America has made these loans. So we could do that ourselves with our own bank. Um, a second argument is that bureaucrats make bad businessmen, but as we heard from Kurt von Mettenheim uh, yesterday, they, uh, studies actually show that state uh, publicly owned banks are not only safer, and more efficient, but actually more profitable than privately owned banks. And the third thing is that um, is that publicly owned banks will put the the public revenues at risk. So, which is more at risk, your money in a in a publicly owned bank or your money in Wall Street? And we've seen recently that Wall Street is a very risky place to put your money. Um, we've poured money into bailing out the banks, and st all we've succeeded in doing is making the too big to fa fail banks even bigger. They're gobbling up the small banks that weren't responsible for the, for the collapse in the first place. So now the um, governments are getting tired of bailing out the banks. The Iceland has stood up to the banks and said they won't do it. In our Dad Frank bill, we have said we won't do it uh, for a big derivatives bust. If, if we're gonna, the Dodd-Frank bill says you can continue to gamble in derivatives, but if you get into big trouble, we're not going to bail you out. And um, in Europe, the, it's the European stability mechanism is how they, all, the, all the EU, or the Eurozone countries agreed to bail each other out and to bail the banks out, and they're balking at that. There was a Dutch finance minister that said recently that the, the um, the Cyprus uh, template was going to be the template for future big bank collapses in the Eurozone. So this, is, this was the big bombshell when we, when we found out that the, um, the Troika, which is the IMF, the ECB, and the, e, the EC, the European Commission, had work, was actually compelling these two big banks to um, to take their depositors' money in, in order to, for, for uh, Cyprus to get a loan from, from the Troika, they would have to 
take their depositors money or a percentage of their depositors money and the depositors of course protested and took to the streets and the politicians refused to do it to their credit but then the so the way it worked out was they didn't take the insured deposits which would be under 100,000 euros in Europe but they did take the uninsured deposits which was anything over that so that included like pension funds and small businesses that needed a lot needed the cash to pay their workers and materials um, and they took actually 60 percent of that money so they just confiscated money of the depositors quite shocking and we have learned that this model was not just a one-off thing but that there was a directive that came down for from the European or from the Financial Stability Board of the um, G20, which we all agreed to in 2009. We agreed to be regulated by this board in the, on the other side of the world. Um, who knows who is pulling the strings of this board, but we agreed to that. And their directives said that all, all the member countries were supposed to have these bail-in provisions where they would, um, if a bank, a too big to fail bank, one of these systemically risky, systemically important banks uh, was insolvent because the taxpayers are no, no longer gonna bail them out, what they should do is bail themselves out or bail in their creditors. Well, it turns out the creditors, the, the largest class of creditors are the depositors. When you legally, when you put your money in the bank, it belongs to the bank and all you have is an IOU. That's why it's called a demand deposit, that when you walk in the bank, you have the right to demand your money and they'll give it to you, assuming they can get it. Um, but in the meantime, they get to do with it as they will. Um, I mentioned this before, but the, the FDIC insurance fund only has 25 billion in it. The, uh, the um, Bank of America alone has a trillion dollars in deposits. Uh, JP Morgan has a trillion dollars in deposits. Both of them have over $70 trillion in um, derivatives, notional value of derivatives. And derivatives have super priority in bankruptcy, the derivatives claims. So that means that if there is a bankruptcy, they will get all the collateral first. So there's not gonna be anything left in the event, let's say there was another $700 billion collapse like, like we had in 2008, there's not gonna be anything left either for the FDIC insurance fund or for the allegedly insured deposit or uh, secured depositors, which would be the state and local governments. They require security when they put revenues in the bank. So it would behoove our state and local governments to set up their own banks, if only to protect themselves from this sort of, sort of um, collapse, which is likely to happen suddenly, the way those things happen. So we should really be getting a fire under them to set up a bank right now, just if only to keep their deposits safe. But once you've done that, you might as well use the bank for what banks can be used for, which is to leverage your funds into credit for your local community um, and uh, all, just all those benefits of owning your own bank, having a credit line with your, with your local governments, um, being able to provide disaster relief, being able to make loans for local projects. Right now the big banks have no, no real interest in local projects and the local banks that do have an interest don't have the ability to make the loans. So I would conclude by saying that um, it's not, really the, it's not really the government that creates the money, and it's not even really the banks that create the money. We create our own money. We go to the bank and we turn our promise to pay into something that we can spend in the marketplace, and that's what money is. And that the ideal sustainable system would be one in which the, the mechanism for turning our loans into or our IOUs into money is a public utility just like a court system. You wouldn't want to go to court and have the judge um, make his decisions based on who paid him the most money. So likewise you don't want um, the judge of your creditworthiness to be susceptible to bribery from whoever's got the most money. 
So if, if you have a publicly owned system, it is sustainable. And I guess I'll end there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.